Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Locked on Seminoles. I'm your host, Max, and joining me today for a full house, we've got Drake and we've got Dave. Today is Mailbag Monday. We are going to get to your questions. We are going to start out by talking about the offensive line. We are going to take a question about the running back room. And then finally, we're going to finish on the, well, the question of the offseason, is Norvell that guy? So Drake, roll that video. Let's get into it and let's answer some questions. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right. Welcome back, folks. Like we said, I'm your host, Max. That's Drake. And that is Dave. And together we are Locked On Seminoles, your favorite daily Florida State podcast and YouTube show. First of all, Thank you for being here. We get to do what we do because you do what you do and you come back and listen. So make sure you subscribe to the show to get all future episodes. Hit that notification bell. And if you're listening on the podcast, make sure you give us a five-star review so we can read that on air as well. Today is our Mailbag Monday episode. We get those directly from the YouTube comments. If you've got something you want to hear about on a future Mailbag Monday, well, like and comment on this video right down below. But gentlemen, y'all ready to dive into some questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First off, shout out to Choach Step with the question of asking which one of the row games are the boys going to this uh, this season coming up? Ooh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think the obvious answer is LSU. If, that's a uh, game. if we do all go to one, but I actually have to look uh, at the schedule to be... I'm not going to the Miami game. I'll tell what you this. You guys? It's going to depend Miami. on how it's going to depend how the season's looking, right? Cuz like if we start off real slow, I'm not going to sh- I'm not wasting my money on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that's a great point. I uh I, I probably will depending on how the season's looking. Oh, actually, so I already know I'm going to the Louisville game cuz that works out perfectly cuz I've got a buddy who has a uh has a membership at Valhalla. So we're going to get to go now. We get to go to a Friday night game, then go mm-hmm. play Valhalla on Saturday. So I'll definitely it's more make important that than the game. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. Well, that's the thing. We we're trying to figure out how to work that out. And the Friday night game works out perfectly. So I'll be playing Valhalla uh, right after that game. And I also would like to go to the NC State game if it's looking like we're going to win. Oh, because I was that's there. actually the one fans. I was going to ask you, Max, that I feel like you and you I don't want to be around agree, But I was there in 2012. I haven't been back since, and I'd yeah, like to too. go get some revenge since this is a year that, like, on paper, as of right now, they should beat us. So I'd like to go see us beat Devin Leary in their stadium and, like, get that sweet, sweet, sweet revenge. All right. I anyway. Have to go with that. No, no, that's a good question. Folks, every question doesn't have to be football-related. You want to know about us? We're happy to answer those as well. Uh, Reg, Reg Ness 0684 always has a lot of good questions. This was in response to my video last week where y'all hated my take about looking forward. I've since clarified that my point was not that wins are, don't matter. It was that we need to win and be preparing for the future. We can't just view next year as like, you know, in a vacuum. Unless so, we're starting AJ Duffy. Well, right, right. Unless it comes to starting AJ Duffy and then I don't like, then like, let's just, anyway, there's caveats to it. So, Reg says, we only lose two O-line off the team in 2023, Gibbons and Lyles. Scott, Harris, Washington, Smith all return. Plus guys like Schrader, Orr, and Herring will be in their third year, not to mention the heavy O-line haul we got in this year's class. Uh, They will be in their second year and won't be forced to start. The only other offensive player we lose in 2023 is Cam McDonald. Why would we not continue to improve? Those are good points. Uh, Here's the thing that I would say. Age does not guarantee success. Um, I'm almost 30 years old, and I'm not good enough to play on Florida State's football team. And I understand that that's a bit of an intellectually lazy argument because I'm not in their system. I'm not practicing with them. But we've seen throughout the course of history that, like, kids nowadays kind of come in pretty close to their ceiling. You know, they go through all these camps. They play seven-ons all the time. 
I don't know what they're putting in the food, but very few kids, except for like, you know, what's his name with the, uh, with the Buffalo bills, Josh Allen, like actually grow in college other than filling out muscle wise. You're right. We will have an older team. They will be more experienced, but I would throw that question back to Reg and in doing so back to you all who on this team do you think is really going to like, I'm not going to say it would get better, let me put it this way. There's a lot of people on this team that I kind of wish were leaving after next year. So hearing we only lose Cam McDonald on the offense, like doesn't really make me very happy. I don't know. How, how do y'all feel about this? I'll, I'll just say this. As it relates to the offensive line, I do think having more starting experience under your belt, unless everyone's just terrible, which I don't think they are, is going to be helpful. It's better to have started more games that. than not started more games, all else equal. I will say one concern I have is with Alex Atkins taking over the offensive coordinator duties, if he's not going to be as, if he's not going to have the t- as much time to devote to developing these kids on the offensive line and that progress gets stunted to any degree, like I know Norvell is still going to be in charge of the offense for the most part. I don't know that there could be a worse thing to happen to our offense than our offensive lines progress being stunted at in any amount. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a, a valid concern. I think the only thing I kind of go against that a little bit because you, you hear so much about how Kane Dillingham was probably JT's like number one fan, and he's probably one of the more instrumental individuals in how Jordan Travis has developed from a passer from last year in the passing to where now he unquestionably is our QB1. And now that you see videos right now of Alex Atkins at the first spring practice, you still see the same sort of like, what's the word, focus he has actually on the entirety of the, of the offensive line too. And then Max with, you know, with the offensive line kids, I mean, it's like, a one concern I had last year was like when they're fully healthy, the offensive line actually played pretty solid. I think the last three games of the year, they grayed out pretty well on pass blocking. And I think for the majority of the, like during the half spots, we had like what well, Robert Scott was out. Darius Washington was out. Murray Smith doubled the injury the entire year that, you know, prevented him from getting some weight. So I think much more that we're worried if these kids can stay healthy for the entire season or else they don't mess with that chemistry going forward the rest of the year. Yeah, and I want to make that point about the offensive line because that got brought up by TR down down in a later comment. But I want to make that point about the offensive line. And this isn't a knock on Alex Atkins, although it'll be spun that way. Um, it's more to Dave's point that, like, having him not be fully dedicated to the offensive line, that's going to happen. So I don't think we can expect the same level of improvement. I also think there's one thing that our fan base is heavily discounting. And that is how much Jordan Travis made the O-line look good. Like when you have to account for a running quarterback, you can't be as ears pinned back, free shooting down the field to get to a quarterback like that. Because with Jordan Travis, tackling him is not your number one priority. Keeping him contained is your number one priority. And the problem with Jordan Travis is that he's so good at running between blockers that it's not just like with most scrambling quarterbacks where you're trying to keep him in between the ends you also have to watch for him stepping up through the lane and gashing you for 40 or 50 yards. I mean, look at the play uh, against, who was it? It wasn't Florida. It was one of our last home games where he drops back. It's like third and 18, and he takes off up the middle and had someone not tugged on his towel, he would have gotten there. What other quarterback is a threat to run down the field on third and 18 and almost get it, right? So, he adds an element that lets your O-line look a lot better at blocking than they actually are. That being said, you're right. They did improve quite a bit. I mean, I look at these, these grades from uh, 2020, their blocking grades and uh, forgive me. It's, it's a bit hard to sort stuff around on, on PFF, but um, when I look at, uh, let me get my position. So you have Marie Smith, right? A 55 in, in, in total blocking uh, 65 in run blocking. Davion, he tried yeah. his best. Dante Heard Lucas in. got a real running start. Brady Scott was abysmal with a 57 in total blocking, but a 71 in pass blocking. Uh, I forgot Andrew Baselli existed. Thomas Schrader was a 49, 48, and 43. That's blocking, run blocking, pass blocking, respectively. Uh, and then we go down to some of our tackles, right? Robert Scott was actually the the second highest rated one behind Devontae Love Taylor, 66, 67, 59. ACC freshman uh, of the year. We jumped to 21 and we look at, okay, how did, how did the team do by position for blocking? And they improved a bit. Marie Smith uh, was actually about the same. And 
uh, look, as much as we talked about, like, it'd be good to have a battle because of what he knows, you know, mentally, uh, I, the more I think about it, like, do y'all think there's really any question that Caden Lyles starts at this position now? No, no. Especially, especially you see the size of Caden Lyles, and then you look at the size of Maurice Smith, who still yeah. did, was dealing with the injury for a while, too. Well, and Max, what you just read off proves one thing to me, that there is, at a minimum, room to grow. Like, it, sure. Whether that, or not way, they that do, was 2020. So I'm looking at now where did they jump to in 21? Right. right. So, but there is room. So it's also, not like they're at their peak. And also, sure, so, Thomas Schrader starting his freshman season on offensive line, and we never, we don't right, want right. to do that anymore. We're not probably no, I'm, gonna do I'm, that I'm with you. Like, so let's yeah. see how they improved, right? Because yeah, exactly. now they, yeah. then they had Alex Atkins, right? So Robert Scott uh, jumped up to a 66, 64, 63, all in the green there. Darius Washington jumped up to a 64, 61, and a 69 at pass blocking. Nice. Um, Ira Henry, who only took like 15 snaps. We won't count him. Um, we go back up to the centers again, just no one. I mean, baby on somehow again, the number one center in the country. Uh, and then you had Dylan Gibbons, right? A 65, 66, 83. Now, when I look at this, Brady Scott also did pretty well with an 86.3 at pass blocking. My point is there was like definite improvement. So in that case, maybe older is better. And it's definitely good to have an older offensive line but the other thing is what we're getting excited getting excited about like our best blockers overall on the whole would still not start at most top 25 programs so my concern is that like they have a very long way to come to be a competent offensive line they're all substantially better at pass blocking than they are at run blocking that's all well and dandy, mostly because, again, Jordan Travis helps them out there. But if you guys had to classify it last year, is Florida State a passing team or a running team? We're a running team, game, obviously. We're a running team, we're a running team, and we're a running With team. bad so, run blocking grades. And, and with bad run blocking grades, right. So, like, I understand the point that the O-line gets older, but my larger point is that, like, to, to Reg's question, it does, like, it, they need to develop a lot more if they're going to be able to get us through this year. And yeah, that's, that, that's kind of where I'll, uh, where I'll leave that at from my, my perspective. But I do think it is a, a very valid point that we're only losing three offensive linemen. And again, next year, we won't be starting a bunch of freshmen. So hopefully, you know, these kids like the Armellas of the world and the other six guys we took actually have time to develop and can actually be like hits for us. But that goes back to what you all yelled at me about all of you in the comments, that is not going to happen until like 2024. We're talking about there. If you're waiting on O-line development, but yet I'm the asshole for talking about the future. You are. So it was a you bad really are. I really can't wait. I yeah. really can't win with you guys here, but what you guys can win with, is betting online through betonline.net. Betonline.net has expanded from its old betonline.ag to now bring you the latest in sports information and stuff that you can use to make sure your lines are the sharpest they possibly can be. And all of that good stuff. It's not just basketball right now, guys. There's hockey, there's UFC, there's boxing. Uh, I think the Olympics are over, but you could probably bet on futures for the next Olympics. I don't know how these things work, but either way, go to bet online today using your mobile device or your computer, place your bets, sign up, all that good stuff, because bet online is where the game starts. And then if just betting on individual games isn't your thing, well, then y'all want to start a pool. You guys want to do a bracket. It's bracketology. I mean, I'm, you know, it is what it is. So go to runyourpool.com and use them to set up your pool this year. Folks, you can even play against all of the locked on network if you want to by going to runyourpool.com slash locked on. You can also use promo code pure madness to get $10 off your custom pool. It's a great way to run your office pool. It's a great way to run your friend pool. Whoever you do your pools through, make sure to use runyourpool.com. And if you want to play against us, runyourpool.com slash locked on. Again, we are back at Mailbag Monday, where we answer your questions to keep you in the know about the things you want to know. If y'all want to be featured in a future Mailbag episode, make sure to DM us on Twitter. I'm at Max Moody 17, you got at 
Tally underscore underscore Drake. Dave doesn't even know what his own Twitter is. You can also go to at Knowles Anonymous, which is us collectively. Send us some questions, all that good stuff. Um, also, since no one asked, I did yard work this weekend. So if you don't do yard no work, asked. I mean, you know, and you don't tell everyone, come on. So guys, our, our next question that we're going to get into is going to be about the running back room. This comes from... Oh, actually, I want to address this one. I want to address this one. Sir5 says, everything you guys say about Randy Shannon, you can say the same about Charlie Strong. The dude hasn't done anything for a long time since his days at Louisville. That was one of those I just wanted to bring up because it was very perplexing. When did we not say that they're basically the same person? It is true. Good comparison. They're basically the same person. I don't think we ever said, though, we were worried about Miami hiring Charlie Strong. Yeah, I'm Apparently in the camp. Is if you like the Randy Shan hire, then you're probably gonna like Charlie Strong hire. And also, if you don't like the Randy Shan hire, you're probably not gonna like the Charlie Strong hire. Yeah. They're they're pretty much not, the same. Not as same. It's the same guy. The only difference not is hire. here's the only difference for me. One works Charlie at Equinox Strong. and one works at Gold's Gym. What'd you say? One works at works at Equinox and one works at Gold's Gym. I thought it was yeah, kind of right. Like, I mean, you, you guys are pants. talking. You guys are talking about a Camry and a Corolla here. I mean, I'm sure the salesman will tell you there's a difference, but. You know, it's basically a Toyota mid-sized. Um, no, but what I will say, and and, and y'all y'all keep me honest here, but there, Randy Shannon has a lot more geographical consistency. He went to high school in Miami. Uh, did he play at Miami? I don't know. He did play in Miami. Yeah, he, he coached at Miami Central. Then he coached at Miami. Then he coached at Florida. Then he coached at UCF. And now he's coaching at Florida State. Whereas Charlie Strong has kind of been all over the place. I mean, he coached at Louisville, coached at Texas. Texas. Uh, I don't know where he was in USF, between those. South Florida but, after after after. He's at South Florida. That's right. So he First bounced around Florida. a lot more, like, again, geographically. And um, the people that you're recruiting, if you're in Texas, typically aren't the people you'd recruit in Florida. So I don't necessarily agree that Randy Shannon has strong Florida ties, but he probably has better ties than Charlie Strong does. Just – just because of that fact, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, in Stewart, Nick Stewart always gives us some good questions. He said, going into this year, I've certainly had high hopes for Toa Philly. Uh, he seems to flash big play potential, and I thought we, he would have put on some size coming into the fall. If that doesn't happen, I can definitely see Ward and Williams getting the bulk of the reps with Benson nabbing goal line work as well. Ward seems to be the do-it-all type, but is a bit lean. Regardless, the key to success will be a strong run game with an effective passing attack to complement. This is a huge year for the program under Norvell, and I expect to see the team, the best team we've seen in the last five years or more. Not that much, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I wanted to bring up what Nick said because I think it, it was kind of what we got to at the end of our last question. And there's so much focus on Jordan Travis, but like our best games last year – we were only asking our quarterbacks to throw like 15 times. I mean, this really is a run first team also relying on the quarterback run. And I yeah. almost think we're talking about the receivers and there's all the, the hate against Jordan Travis for like, that's undeserved in my opinion about, you know, maybe he's not the best passer or whatever. And people forget like, that's not the DNA of this team. The DNA of this team is running the football. And even if that's not going to be the DNA of this team, we have got to figure out a way, like absolutely have to figure out a way to not have the worst in the country starting position on second down. We've got to start getting three or four yards on first down. And you typically do that by running the ball. So I don't know. What do you, what do you all think? I mean, do you think that's probably about the breakdown that we'll, we'll see of the, the ward and, Ward and Toa Philly? Do you think it's going to be Ward and Williams? Like, how do y'all see that room shaking out? And more importantly, how critical to the team's success do you think it is that we have a strong running game? I think it's a, a very critical because I think it needs to be supplemented with the passing attack. Because if you do look at Mike Narval, actually, when he is at Memphis, he did somehow show, showcase Brady White actually as a decent passer, especially with De literally, I was going to say that. Yeah, with DeMonte Coxey, also with Calvin Austin, who's about to get drafted to the NFL. So to me, it's something like we need the Russian tech stack to stay where it is, but now we need to be able to – Jordan needs to take the next step to developing actually into a solid passer because I think he only had two games last year 
where he had over 250 yards, right? And that's something that we do, you know, shift some blame to wide receivers, you know, with no separation, with no not running any clear routes, also because of Ron Dugans. But now he kind of has those weapons around him. So to me, the DNA has to be – this offense was predicated on being built for playmakers. And you can't only have them in the backfield. They have to be on the outside too. So to me, maybe go like 65 70%. That would be probably be a, a mixture of Ward and Williams with like Benson, I think, doing goal line work is probably what you're going to see. I kind of agree with him. But then the rest of that needs to go probably to the passing attack. Let, let me say this. I don't think you bring in this many receivers in the transfer portal unless you have just a, a, a plan to make the passing game a concerted effort. Like, it, it signals to me a good thing, which is that Norvell trusts Jordan Travis's development as a passer. And if that's the case, he needed better weapons to throw to. And I would expect to see more intent to not necessarily be a pass first team, but to not necessarily rely so heavily on the run and not just the run game, like traditionally with running backs, but like the Jordan Travis running game, the running back running game. And then like, Oh, we'll do pass or pass action off of that. Like yeah. play action having off the of that. option to like to complement a very solid running game to keep, you know, teams kind of guessing a little more yes. off balance. Cause we do need them more. Cause we didn't have that often last year. Right. Yeah. We just, I mean, again, we just need to succeed on first down though, because we can't, because no, Here's, here's the thing. No quarterback is going to be good with the offensive line we had last year, who I know they're getting older, but still the same dudes remains to be seen if they're going to be able to actually, you know, they're going to be able to block. And I know that everyone right now thinks that they are, but I, the evidence shows us that they're not, and they may be able to like, they've gotten better at slowing dudes down but go watch teams that are really good at blocking. They haven't gotten to there yet. So it's really hard to play quarterback when you're a behind that and B when you're constantly in third and eight, third and nine, second and eight, second and nine, and the defense just knows what's coming. In fact, the only reason, like I said earlier, that Jordan Travis was able to have some of the success he was having is because they always have to have a defender accounting for what he's about to do with his legs. You don't have that last year. Like last year, if you had a pocket passer, you don't even win five games because look, you're constantly look, second and nine, and they're just dropping look back what happened. nine guys. Look when Mackenzie Milton came in. They were like begging us Okay, but, but but we all knew Mackenzie Milton you know, after the third game's like, listen, he's not the same pocket passing quarterback. Like, to be fair. Yeah, but Dave's making the – no, but the point Dave's making isn't that. Dave's making the point that – Oh no, I agree. Like, you like a pure, a if you're a pure pocket passing quarterback, last year you probably would have been eaten alive the first five games because the offensive line was just hit by you know injury bug. But then it's you look further the down. Line though, that's not my point. My point is that if you're not getting six to seven yards on first down, if you're constantly in okay. obvious passing downs, it doesn't matter how good of a passer you are. They're dropping nine and rushing three every time. So mm -hmm. it's like. My mask off. They're dropping, they're dropping eight. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. They're dropping eight and they're just, they're just putting three to put enough pressure on you, you know, and that's it. And good luck getting enough guys open. Like imagine if Bo Nix was our quarterback last year. It's like, yeah, he might burn you with his legs every now and then, but if you're in second and nine or third and nine, 15 times during the game, we'll take our chances just dropping back into pure coverage. And that's going to be the biggest issue to fix with the run game is not like, can, the, can they get better or just can the blocking get better, but can we stop getting in these long down and distances where it's just blatantly obvious what we're about to do with the ball? Speaking of blatantly obvious, folks, sometimes a bet is blatantly obvious, but sometimes it's not. And that's why it's important that you have the right team in your corner. And you can do that by using Stat Hero. Stat Heroes NCAA single game pickums pits the star players against each other in an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. You can take control back from the handicappers that always seem to have an advantage, and you can start focusing on the players you know best with a gameplay that doesn't rely on big spreads, long odds, or funky props. Stat Hero gives you the advantage, resulting in their gamers winning four times more often. Why? Well, because Stat Hero eliminates the mystery about who or what you're going up against. In addition to their pick em games, they also have dozens of lineups you can comb through to take on head to head. They simply post sets of players for you to take on with a set of players you choose. 
And Stat Hero is the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fix. The sleek, simple gameplay will have you playing in minutes. This is what daily fantasy was meant to be. And if all that winning works up an appetite, well, it's time to grab yourselves a built bar. Y'all already know what's going on. 17 grams of protein, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 130 calories. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the bar to help you keep your New Year's resolution. Well, that and the pull-up bar. Tastes like a candy bar, hits like a protein bar. Built Bar. So make sure y'all go to builtbar.com and use promo, promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Torrance Barnes comes to us and says, this is a slow process. You've got to have patience. I hope people didn't think Norvell was going to come in and poof. Everything was magically just going to change. This program has been on the decline since Jimbo left. All of the me, me, me players are gone. And last year, you could see the improvement with how they fought and just didn't quit during games like in previous years. That was the culture change I saw. He had the same type of success at Memphis. It was a slow burn, but he left that program pointed in the right direction. This season, the Seminoles will make a bowl game, and I think we will see a vast improvement in the program as far as wins. Also, don't sleep on JT, because if you can't see the improvement from that dude from where he started, you don't know football. Look, if we don't see an uptick this year in wins, maybe Norvell's not the guy, and we'll be looking for the next guy. But until, until then, give him the season, and let's see. Like I said, it's a slow process, but I think we're going to be good this year. Just put it this way. We'll be contending for a spot in the ACC championship this year. Mark my words. Lots to unpack there. Torrance, thanks for the good question, man. Um, and again, folks, if you want to get questions in Mailbag Monday, drop them on this episode, and we will get to them. Um, okay, so here's my thing. He says that the me, me, me players are gone. You could see the improvement and how they didn't quit. Guys, I feel like this is a talking point that we kind of forgot about. And I, I'm i glad Torrance brought it up because, like, that is one thing. I, I would say that was the most substantial improvement this year, really. I mean, it, there were so many games this year. Put it this way, the Louisville game, let's just use that as an example because I think that's the best litmus barometer, which is a uh, locked-on Seminoles trademark phrase copper that measures copper acidity copper and air pressure. And uh, But that's a great point by Torrance because – you look at the Louisville game the year before and we just gave up and they just took us to the freaking woodshed made us cut our own switch off the branch. And then we had to sit there while they spanked us with it, but they did that to us. And then look at the game before, right? Like they were blowing us out at halftime and I get, you know, Bud Elliott and Ingram would say that, you know, we, they kind of took their foot off the gas, which like I think is probably valid. But previously, we would have also taken our foot off the gas. And like Malik Cunningham's a dark horse Heisman candidate, and we gave them everything they wanted in the second half, and we brought that back to being a close game. Same with Clemson. I mean, that team was far more talented than we were. Yeah, we need a crazy Jermaine Johnson strip sack recover touchdown to keep it as close as it was, but we still fought hard. Like, I can't remember a game this year where it felt like the team gave up. Thinking back to 2020, I could think of like nine different games where we gave up and we Max, only played 11. Let, let me ask you both a question here then. 2022, sure. if we're looking the same way that it's obvious in every game that we're not giving up and that the effort's there, there's no give up and there's no selfish football, but we don't make a bowl game. Is that is that enough to you, even if all those things come true? No, no. And actually was going to go to my point. Like, I actually think the point is valid because they're like Max is saying, we got boat raced by Miami on national TV. Yeah. We got like boat raced in a majority. Embarrassingly. Race. And to me, it does take a lot, you know, as a coach to convince your guys, hey, I know we're out eight and four and then finishing off, I think, what, five and three for the rest of the way out. That's actually, that is a good sign for him. My only thing is I don't rest on my laurels for that in criticizing him for the season that's going forward. I don't think that's something we should bring in to next season because that's great. You tried very hard. You still suck. That's not going to be anything for me for that. And then with the Justin, the Mike Norvell comment at Memphis, he took over for Justin Fuente, who was basically competing for the conference every single year and then went to Virginia Tech. And actually, he, Mike Norvell, for his second year there, was 8-6. and six. The year after, he was 12-2 and two and just got at the right time when UCF was coming down. So to me, we don't know if he's able to build off that. We know he can sustain it, so that's more of where I'm considering people saying he was able to build a program. 
No, he improved on what a good thing was already there. And that was kind of my sticking point with him. We got hired. Yeah, total, totally different situations. I will agree with that. At Memphis, yeah. totally different. Um, what I will say though, Drake is, and I don't think you meant it this way, but I just want to clarify, like, I think he, we do still want to see the effort next year. We oh, just want the effort yeah, yeah, yeah. to be like wins. You know, when you have a team that doesn't quit a team exactly. that works hard, like eventually you're going to start winning football games. I think, um, yeah. So I want to get to the last part of the question. This actually comes from Dante Hall as well, but they both touched on it of, you know, they, they both have basically said, look, Mike can get us to seven or eight games. Can he get us to that elite level again? That's what I was getting to about like, is just winning seven or eight games enough this year. And DJ Ferg said, Max got it all wrong. And TR agreed TR. I thought we were friends, but that's cool. Uh, so that's the last part. Like, I don't, I don't know if you can gauge that because like at this point in his career, even though the recruiting classes were a lot better and he'd done as a coordinator, we were asking ourselves the same question about Jimbo, right? Like could Jimbo actually win a championship or was he just going to be like a perennial ACC title contender? Cause remember year three with Jimbo was 2011, right? Jimbo's third year. Here's what happened. The year before that, we got absolutely annihilated by Oklahoma, right? So then we come in this year, and we play Oklahoma at home. Crazy game. EJ gets hurt. We lose 23-13, which I still, to this day, will always contend that was one of the worst officiating calls I've ever seen. Kenny Shaw caught the ball, made a football move. by taking two, But either way, what should, the call that should have been made, you can go watch that game. The touchdown. And, no, no, it should have been a caught ball, fumble on the one-yard line, recovered by Oklahoma. Instead, we ended up punting to Oklahoma, and they got the ball in like their own 45, ended up scoring a touchdown. We should have had them backed up where our band was on the one-yard line trying to get out of there, and even though we lost the ball, it would have flipped the field. But that, that should have wrapped that. this one up here. Not Just saying. Anyway. So when we ask if Mike Norvell's the guy, right, we look at Jimbo's third year and he lost to Oklahoma, lost to Clemson, lost to Wake Forest, uh, had a pretty good stretch, and then lost to Virginia on that ridiculous missed kick that we got to twi try twice and missed twice. And it was kind of like, uh, okay, well, uh, you know, I guess we beat Florida and Miami, but like, is he the guy? And then 2012, it was like, okay, well, Maybe he is the guy. Oh, we lose to North Carolina State at home at North Carolina State. And then we got spanked by Florida. And yeah, we bear, we didn't even win by a full touchdown against Georgia Tech in the ACC championship. Next year, we all know what happens. We win the national championship. So the point I'm making is like, if we win eight games next year, I don't know if we'll be able to answer if Mike Norvell is the guy. Like, because you're not really the guy until you are the guy. I don't, so I, I don't know. I don't let me make it easier for you. It doesn't seem like it as of right now. He was put in a position where it probably wasn't going to be possible for him to turn into the guy. Um, but I will say as it relates to Jimbo, he was recruiting at such a ridiculous level, despite the performance not catching up to the recruiting at that point, that it was obvious he was building something that was going to eclipse the performance you saw on the field. That can't quite be said yet here. Uh, I hope that changes. But you would have to see, you'd have to see something ridiculous from Norvell. Like you'd have to see like a nine win team this year and like an 11 win team next year to say like, yeah, he's the guy you're right. It's going to be impossible to tell after this year, whether or not that's true, but it's unlikely. I mean, that is a good point though. Like you're never like Max point brings out, like, you're, you're never the guy until, you know, it happens. And that's like, you continue to like, I think they asked anything of Kirby smart every single year top two, top three recruiting classes. Will he ever win? Will he ever be the guy to finally bring UGA that hardware? And eventually he did. So we're never going to know that answer until he, you know, wins a championship and goes to the CFP or he gets fired. That's there's all, there's no, there's yeah. only absolute with this type of question like that. But with Jimbo, I mean, the Jimbo one is a little bit different because like, I mean, you're right, but Jimbo also was 31 and 10 when he was going to the national championship year. So it's also kind of like all the signs point to as Dave alluded to, we only have eight wins in two years. So for right now, I don't think he's the guy. And to yeah. me, it's something that where he's Ron Zook, bringing in a bunch of talented players, raise the floor of the program, and wait, you know, till the year after that, me and Dave will be, you know, campaigning for Lane Kiffin and coming to town and be the new head coach. So, but, but to kind of put a bow on, on my point, I think 
being the guy is it's, it's two different things here, right? For Mike Norvell, when we say being the guy, it's like, can he just get us to a conference championship, right? Whereas for Jimbo, you're right. He was 31 and 10. It was, well, Jimbo might not be the national championship winner, but the standard, and we can say the standard is the standard, but come on, that's BS. Like the standard right now would just be to get back to conference championship games and then we'll worry about winning them and then we'll worry about championships. Mm -hmm. See, like, that's where I'm like, the expectations change. But right. the standard eventually always remains the same. You're right. Sorry. The standard is the standard at Florida State. Like you do want to compete for championships, but that's what I mean. The the expectations of what we will call success for him is different than what Jimbo had to do to be considered successful. But after 2012, there was a very strong contingent of the fan base that wanted Jimbo fired because it was like, look, he's finally got the best team, did all the recruiting, and he embarrassed us, you know, in that upset loss. Oh, and by the way, we got spanked by Florida at home, 37, 26 and like, cool, good job. You can beat up on all the, like the misfits of the ACC, but you can't actually win the games that matter. So um, now they weren't, wasn't a contingent of people that are actually going to get him fired, but you know, there was that, uh, the, uh, the standards were higher back then. We'll just put it that way. It, um, it helped having, it helped having James, knowing Jameis was going to come in and do against it. What we all knew he was going to do against it. So if AJ Duffy happens to be Jameis, then yeah, Norvell will probably be the guy. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, there's, there's very much that too, but as, as, as to the point of the one thing y'all know, I don't like doing, giving you a firm answer. Do I think that he can, after he gets us to eight wins coach at an elite level? I do not. I just don't think that Norvell will ever be a national championship coach. I like the Ron Zook comparison. I think he's turned the culture around. I think he can get to seven or eight wins. I think he can consistently win, maybe even up to 10. But, you know, there's just kind of like a you have it or you don't. And I just don't know if I see. And to me, this is based on two things. One, recruiting. Again, I brought this up last week and y'all told me I was crazy. But I think it's a valid point. Like, we're having these big junior days. Great his average recruiting class has been number 20 Jimbo's average recruiting class after three years was what? Like, like eight top right? five, I think. Well, he'd had a top five, but I'm saying his average because his first year was like 11th, I think. So yeah, his, but his average was, excuse me, was in the top 10. Norvell's not doing that. He's not showing really any signs of being able to do that. I saw one comment that said, because we brought in so many O linemen, our recruiting class was artificially diluted. I, uh, don't really agree i see the point but i don't know uh and finally i think that he is not a good ceo i think that mike norvell has a plan for everything but just having worked with a lot of ceos and, and stuff i just i think he's too much of a micromanager and i don't think you're ever going to be able to run a successful college football program when you try to micromanage everything it's the same reason the dallas cowboys can't win because jerry jones won't get out of the way of the people he hires and let them actually do their job and win championships. But that's just my personal opinion. So, uh, folks, we really enjoy Mailbag Monday. We will keep getting to mailbags. Make sure y'all are here every single day of the week. We drop our YouTube episode at 7 a.m. Eastern. So it's good to wake up to if you're on Central. It's good to start your day at work, you know, maybe in a minimized window uh, if you work on the East Coast. But either way, we are very happy you're here. We love that y'all come by every single day. And if there's anything y'all want to talk about, drop a comment, or if there's just anything we can do to improve, if there's, you know, stuff you want to know more about, if there are things, suggestions, those kinds of things, let us know. We read every YouTube comment, because just like y'all, we're millennials and we're on our phones all the time. So that's Drake at Tally underscore underscore Drake on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Max Moody 17 Dave's Twitter has like a bunch of numbers that should be letters, but it's some form of go Knowles. And collectively, we are at Knowles Anonymous. Thanks for stopping by, and we will see y'all bright and early tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Coach K. Coach K.